How's it going everybody? This is Beat the Bush. Today I'm going to show you step by step how to build a hand truck battery backup system that is super cheap. The main components is you need a hybrid inverter if you want to charge it via solar. I have a sponsor from Golden Mate that provided me these batteries. Today I'm going to be using two of these Orion 12 volt batteries. They are lithium iron phosphate batteries. It's a little bit on the premium price because it has wireless connectivity and also they have computer interface so you can pretty much read the same information as from the wireless Bluetooth. This right here is a cheapy one, three kilowatt, 24 volt system two 12 volt batteries you string them in series is 24 volt at 100 amps they can provide around 2500 watts so just a tiny bit underpowered for my hybrid inverter the advantage of building your own is that you can select your components you can buy cheaper ones and put them together if part of it fails maybe the battery you can swap out the battery and you don't have to throw the entire thing away to put all this together you'll need some additional parts like this hand truck is like 30 40 dollars at Harbor Freight. I bought these straps on sale for like $8. You'll need a DC circuit breaker. This is very important because when you have a DC current, if an arc forms, it actually keeps on going. Whereas when you have an AC source, AC means alternating current. So the waveform goes up and down. And whenever it crosses zero, there's exactly zero current through that circuit. And that is the time where the arc would actually stop. DC doesn't do that. It will just keep on going and going. So in order to break the arc, an arc is like when you have two contacts and electricity just flows through the air from one contact to another. In order to break that, you need the distance of those two contacts far enough apart and possibly to stop the arc from forming in the first place. It disconnects very, very quickly. So just get DC breakers to begin with to avoid these problems. And so let's start putting this thing together. Put your batteries on the hand truck. I'm comfortable using two gauge wires whenever I'm running 100 amps. These three foot section cables are from Alpha and you can just buy them pre-made so you don't even have to crimp the cables or do the heat shrink yourself. These guys I made myself and they're more specialized in terms of length but if you cannot find something like this you can just as well use one foot sections. And let's connect them one at a time. Unfortunately, you do need some wrenches to tighten these things. Putting the cover back on. Verify that the voltages are exactly the same before connecting them. 13.3, 13.3. If you buy them at the same time, most likely they're going to be the same. If they're not the same, and I haven't seen this just yet when they're sent together, you do need to charge them up to full, connect them together, positive to positive, negative to negative, and then wait a few hours for them to equalize before you can connect them together in series. Now that we know the voltage is exactly the same, we can connect them in series. And you want to stack the voltages on top of each other. Negative to this positive terminal is 12 volts. And then you want to stack on top of that. So you put the negative terminal on top of this positive terminal. And then from here to here is 24 volts. Let me connect this, bolt it down, put the cap on. And then we can see this should be 26.6 volts. Right there. I'm securing them with some zip tie, at least on the top for now. This bend here is a little bit smaller, so I can latch onto that and keep it from falling down. I think I'll double zip tie it just to be sure. You're supposed to mount these inverters upright. They have fan systems that expects it to be upright. The screen also wants to be upright. All the wires come from down here. Using this hold down, just strap it in. I like to connect this end first because there's no power to it yet. Battery plus, that's the red terminal. We gotta make sure it really is plus. The screw actually goes right through my lugs. So I need to add another washer here so it doesn't go all the way through and it gives good contact surface. Put the other one in there. Because this looks a little bit sketchy, I'm gonna double check this connection later on under a load test with a thermal camera. Now I need to add in a breaker, so I have this stubby wire here. Put it on one side of the breaker, bolt it down in place, attach the other side of this terminal. Ignore the coloring of this wire here. I don't have a stubby red one for now. Attach it there, bolt this in place. Put the cap back on. Attach a cable from the inverter to this positive side. 
the battery will output a lot of current if you want it to and the inverter wants a lot of inrush current in the beginning so we want to slow this down with a pre-charge resistor i have my voltmeter set at 20 amps current so let's see how much current it takes three amps right at the beginning right there and it goes to zero very quickly now we can connect it without a spark I want to double check the fuse work. So I'm going to check the battery voltage right at the inverter, 26.6. If I open up the breaker, the inverter is on, it slowly draws it to zero. So at least the switch is working. And if we close this breaker, all this stuff lights up. We got it all wired up correctly. It's pretty simple. Two batteries, four cables total, and it says 26.6 volts. Everything okay so far. So we can turn this back off and disconnect the battery and then we can work on putting those other cables in. I want to secure these batteries really well on here. And if I tie both the batteries individually and attach this towards a hand truck, it's gonna try to pull this battery in and it'll put pressure on these terminals. So I had to find this two by four, 19 inch long to go along the back. So now we can pull this in, it can rest on this two by four and it won't put pressure on these lugs. I ended up putting the clamp right there. I purposely got a cheaper cart that's not too heavy duty and it can support the weight of the batteries and the inverter. And this seems to be holding up pretty well in terms of weight. I bought a six foot extension cable that I can cut up. It's 15 amp capable, so up to only about 1875 watts. So it's a little bit undersized. If you want to run it all the way up to 3000 watts, you probably will need two of these in parallel. Cut it up in half. One will be for the AC in and one will be for the AC out. Strip it very carefully, making sure not to cut any of the insulation in the inner wires. The wires internally are 14 gauge, it says right here. We just use the third hole because that's 14 gauge, it says right here, 14 gauge. For the wiring of the AC, if you're ever unsure, you can always beep it out with a voltmeter. Even very cheap voltmeters will work for this. It's gonna beep. So looking into the socket, the bigger blade is always neutral. The white is usually neutral, but not always. And the black is lying. So you see it doesn't connect. If we switch it over, that is line one and it beeps. And usually green is always ground. So we can put that to ground, the bottom hole right there. So now we know which wire is which. 14 gauge blue, looks like it'll fit this ground screw here. Make sure it's secure. I'm going to attach a ground here. Put the other two wires through here. Put in a neutral wire. Adding in the AC in cable. String that through. Make sure none of the insulation is clamped underneath the screw. Wiggle it around to make sure you can't pull it out. And all this is secure. I have some MC4 solar connectors I can connect to over here. And then you can connect your solar panels to it. However, you probably want some DC circuit breakers in between the solar panel and this inverter just to protect the inverter. I don't have a breaker between the wall and this plug. If I'm plugging it into the house, I know there's a circuit breaker in the panel to protect me. The hybrid inverter usually recommend a circuit breaker on every input or output. I decided to add a 25 amp breaker, just a little peace of mind, just in case it needs it. But instead of trying to put it on a board, I'm just gonna strap it in with some zip ties. There we go. Turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. If this trips, yes. These DIY projects, it's a little crazy. This is not kid friendly. Don't have kids around this stuff because there are some potential danger spots that you don't want to touch. And it's actually not intuitive to try to shield this off because you need airflow into the hybrid inverter. There are 24 volt contacts over here that you could accidentally short out. So you gotta follow proper precautions to not have kids around. Cut these off. I have always find the zip ties a little sharp, so I'm gonna round them off here. Okay, I'm gonna put the final panel back on. Let's connect something to it. It says it's pretty close to full, but generally these things aren't very good at telling you how much capacity is left. The AC output is on at 120 volts. We can quickly verify it 
by putting the leads into the AC output and we have 120 volts. So this is ready to use. Let me connect the heater to it. I enabled the eco mode. So the AC is outputting two volts, but as soon as it sees some kind of load, it'll turn it on, but it takes a little while. See, I turned it on and it takes up to maybe 30 to 60 seconds or so. So let's wait for that. There we go. Now it's on. Output battery, 50 amp, 1.4 kilowatts. And because I'm using these Orion batteries, they have a Bluetooth connection. I can touch this guy and it has 82%. If I turn on the heater again, it's taking 800 watts from one battery and 800 from the other one. Now you can also use the Golden Mate app to check out the battery status. I have over here two batteries. I can just look at one of them. It says it has 82% capacity left, 13.19 volts, current draw of 1.3 amps because the inverter is on right now, which is 17 watts. You gotta multiply this by two because I got two batteries here. If I turn on the heater, which is 1.5 kilowatts, it says it's drawing 65 amps now. The power of 770 watts. Look a little bit lower and we'll see temperature measurements in the battery. One MOS, one E1, one T2, T3, T4, T5. One of the more difficult things is to set up all the parameters within this hybrid inverter. So let me show you all the parameters I've set up. This hybrid inverter has over 28 parameters when you set it on lithium iron phosphate battery. When you use energy from this hybrid inverter, it needs to know if it wants to take energy from the AC input from the wall, from the battery or the solar inputs. Similarly, when it charges, should it only take energy from the solar or the AC input? Each of those are separate things. And when it switches from one to another, these are all settings inside. The first setting is just escape out of the menu. You can just as well escape out of the menu by pushing set. The first parameter is output source priority. Where should the source energy come from? Should it come from the AC input? Should it come from the battery or the solar input? The second one, you just set it to whatever frequency that your mains is operating at. The third parameter is not too important. If the output is only 120 volt, it doesn't really matter which one you set it to. If it's a 240 volt machine, it allows you to have a wider input range and still be operational. The fourth one is battery to utility set point. When the battery is less than this voltage, it would switch over to the AC input in less than 10 milliseconds. The fifth one, utility to battery set points. So when your batteries are low enough, it's switched over to AC and it needs to recover to this before it draws energy from the battery again. The sixth parameter is charge source priority. Do you want it to charge using the solar first, the mains first, or maybe you want to use the solar and mains at the same time. This means that it will try to use both of them and charge at the maximum rate that you programmed it to. PV only is something I personally like because I don't like to draw from the mains because then you have to pay for that. If you set it on PV first, if the PV is not there, it's gonna charge the batteries with the mains. So if you don't want to use the mains, you want to set it to PV only. That means that even if it's drained to 20%, then it's gonna start using the AC input for its energy because there's no more energy in the battery. Allow the solar to charge a battery back up. Once it's charged enough, it's gonna switch off the AC in and it's gonna use the battery again. So different modes of using it. Some of it, it's more intensive for using the battery. Other modes, you can kinda use it kinda like a battery backup system. Most of the time, it's charged up. If the AC mains cuts out, then you have stored energy for you to use. Max charge current is 40 amps. This is measured in how much current is going into the battery, not how much current is coming in from the AC line. This is different because the AC line is a higher voltage, therefore it will register at a lower current. So whenever you look at the parameters in here, the amperage is how much current is charging the battery. You want to set this at whatever your battery says is a reasonable charge current. You don't always want to charge it at like the maximum because this generates excessive heat and it's gonna lower the lifespan of the battery. So slow and steady is the way to charge these batteries. At the same time, you don't want it to be too slow because then you won't charge up the batteries very quickly. We just look up the manual on these batteries. Rated charge current, 20 amps. 
maximum charge current 50. I would set it at 20 amps charging. For the eighth parameter, you select the type of battery that you're using. You can use user-defined lead acid, vented lead acid, seven string lithium iron phosphate, eight string lithium iron phosphate, nine string lithium iron phosphate, ternary lithium battery. So we're concentrating on lithium iron phosphate. Each of these 12 volt batteries has four cells. That means it's four strings. When you connect them in series, Together, there are eight strings. For this one, you would choose L08. Let me show you guys the voltage of one single cell. The typical voltage for one cell is 3.2 volts, and it can range from all the way down to 2.5 volts, which is really, really low. You don't want to discharge a cell that low. And very, very high is 3.65 volts. You also don't want to charge it that high. The high voltage causes the internal cell to build up these things called the dendrites. When this happens, it stays in there permanently and it keeps on growing and growing until it shorts out internally. So you don't want that to happen. Keep the voltage below 3.65 and some people even recommend 3.6. And also you don't want to discharge it too much either. So you might want to set the minimum voltage somewhere between zero and 10%, depending on how much you want to baby the battery. Now that's for one single cell. You multiply it by four to get to the 12 volt. And then you multiply that by two to get to the 24 volt so you know the drop dead voltage for the entire pack is 29.2 volts and you definitely don't want to discharge it beyond 20 volts people might want to disconnect the battery even at 22 volts because at that point you discharge most of the battery capacity already you're not going to get that much more so why discharge it even further boost charge voltage i have it set at 28.8 but the drop dead maximum voltage for a 24 volt battery pack is 29.2. You can set it at 29.2, but it really depends on how much you want to baby the battery. And even if you set it at 28.8 volts, once it reaches there, you don't want to charge it at that voltage for too long. If you just keep on charging it indefinitely, that might break it. It comes to the 10th parameter. How long do you want to charge it for? at this boost charge voltage. You can set it from five to 900 minutes and the default is 120 minutes. Battery floating charge voltage is for user defined battery type. So not very relevant for lithium iron phosphate. Over discharge voltage, this is based on the battery type because we're using an eight cell lithium iron phosphate. We can look at our chart. Over discharge voltage is somewhere between 20 and 24 volts. If you set over discharge at 24 volts, it will never discharge less than 10% capacity of the battery. So I personally set it at 21 volts. That's really, really low. That's probably around two or 3% or so. You also don't want to set this too high because big loads draw the voltage down. So if you have a sudden big load, it might momentarily draw the voltage below whatever you set this at and suddenly cut it off. So you want this reasonably low, but not too high either. So over discharge delay time. This is so that when you have those big loads momentarily for maybe a few seconds, it's gonna hold off on cutting off the battery for you. So you can draw the battery momentarily down and as soon as those loads goes away, it pops right back up. It doesn't cut off your battery and nothing happens. So you want the delay time to be long enough to sustain these momentary loads. The 14th parameter is battery under voltage alarm. This is just an alarm. If the battery happens to be lower than this, it's just gonna start beeping. If not, you can lower it all the way to the battery cutoff voltage. The battery discharge limit. This is the hard discharge limit and I've set it to 0% of the battery, which is 20 volts. This is pretty harsh on the battery. You probably never wanna go there if you have a choice at this voltage. Everything is going to turn off to prevent damage to the battery. Power saving mode is really for the inverter output. There is an inverter in here that converts it to 120 volt AC. So if you're drawing less than 50 watts, it's going to sense that, hey, you're not really using it. So it's going to turn off the inverter. So this is power saving mode. If the inverter is on, it draws some amount of power in order to run the inverter. So I like the power saving mode, unless of course, you always want it on because you have something that's relatively low power, maybe like 30, 40 watts, and you want it to run it 24 seven. Restart when overload. If you enable this, it will restart after three minutes and it'll do it five times. Sometimes you might overload it accidentally and you want it to restart on its own. Restart when over temperature, if it overheats, 
Do you want it to restart? Or if it goes over temperature, do you want it to just completely shut off and not restart? That's a choice. Alarm enable, so you can enable or disable the sounds it makes. After you use this a while, you kind of know what's going on. Then I start turning off the alarm. Beeps when primary source is interrupted. The primary source can be different things. It can be either the battery, it can be you know the solar input or the AC input. If it's using that and suddenly it goes away, then it will sound an alarm saying something happened to it. But that does not necessarily mean that your output will be interrupted depending on your settings. For example, if the battery goes out, it could very well switch over to the AC input and your power will just keep on ticking. Bypass output when overloaded. This would require your AC mains to be able to supply enough power for whatever you're loading. If it's over three kilowatt, it can automatically switch to the mains and then keep you powered. Max AC charger current. This is different than the seventh parameter, which is charge current. Charge current is what's the maximum that you wanna put into the battery. This parameter is what's the maximum amount you want to take out of the wall and put it into the battery. This is very convenient if you know you have a certain breaker limit on the wall, or this might be useful if you just want to use at a very low rate. Maybe you only want to charge at 100 watts or so. So you can set this to very, very low and just draw small amounts from the AC. The next parameter is split phase. It's not supported with this particular unit. It's only 120 volts. Battery under voltage recovery point. So if you're on battery only and there's no AC plugged in or anything, it's gonna turn off your inverter if the battery gets to a certain point. It needs the battery to be charged back to a certain level before it'll turn the inverter back on. The idea is you don't wanna keep on discharging the battery. And so this is a voltage that you set for the battery to recover to. Perhaps you're charging it via the solar or maybe the AC in and the solar, you know, the sun comes and goes and eventually it's gonna charge it up to this particular voltage. And once these batteries gets charged enough, it will switch the inverter back on, meaning it's drawing power from the battery again and putting AC output on the output. PV charger limit. This is again in terms of current into the battery. Depending on your solar, you might want to change this parameter to allow the maximum solar to go into the battery. If you have really big panels, of course you wanna take all the energy possible while the sun is shining to charge these guys up. So in those cases, I might just not want to charge at 20 amps only. Battery fully charged recovery point. Whatever voltage you set at fully charged, let's say it's 29.2 volts. If it charges all the way up there and it says, okay, the battery is full 100%, it cuts it off. It doesn't wanna charge it anymore. At what point does it charge it again? Right? It needs the voltage to drop to a certain point before it tries charging again. So this is the setting for that. You can say, maybe I wanna draw it down all the way down to 20% before charging it back up to 100%. So you can decide how much to discharge it and when it will try to recharge it again. If you got these connected via solar, I probably would set it at 80%. Once it drops down there, okay, fine top it back off to 100%, right? Because I want to capture all that solar electricity as much as possible. AC output voltage, you can change this to 100, 105, 110, 120, depending on how much voltage your appliances need. All of the parameters are pretty important, but I fiddle the most with parameter one and parameter six. Parameter one is at SBU because I wanna draw energy from the battery mainly. Parameter six is usually at OSO, which means only charge the battery with the solar and not the AC in at all. The way I'm describing it now is mainly to only try to charge with the sun, but you can just as well convert this into basically a UPS system where if you connect this to the wall, it will bypass all the energy into the output. And if the AC from the wall ever cuts off, it's gonna switch very quickly within 10 milliseconds and supply power to the AC output from the battery. So in effect, you have a UPS backup system. This is what it looked like if you push it around. Look at that. It's not too heavy, but then I think I'll have a hard time lifting this into the trunk of the car. It's kind of like an awkward shape. Can I lift it like this? Ugh like that. About 2,500 kilowatt hour of energy, 3,000 watt output 
Of course, I only got 1800 watt cables here. But the great thing about building your own is you learn a lot about each individual component. It's also highly, highly repairable. If you guys are interested in the Golden Mate batteries with the Bluetooth connectivity, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. I hope this video helps you guys out on building your own. Thanks for watching this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to give me a like and subscribe for more.